All right, hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, The Great Migration Study Project Continues, Series 3, 1636 to 1638. My name is Kathleen McKenzie, Education and Programming Manager here at American Ancestors, and I will be moderating today's program. American Ancestors is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history, and we're pleased to offer such pro programming for our members and friends around the world. This program today is brought to you by the Brew Family Learning Center. Our presenter today is Chief Genealogist David Allen Lambert. David has been on the staff of American Ancestors since 1993 and is an internationally recognized speaker on the topics of genealogy and history. He has published many articles in the New England Historical and Genealogical Register, the New Hampshire Genealogical Record, Rhode Island Roots, The Mayflower Descendant, and American Ancestors Magazine. He has also published a guide to Massachusetts cemeteries. David is an elected fellow of the Massachusetts Historical Society in Boston, Mass, and is a life member of the New Hampshire Society of the Cincinnati. He is also the tribal genealogist for the Massachusetts Punk Pog Indians of Massachusetts. His genealogical expertise includes New England and Atlantic Canadian records of the 17th through 21st century, military records, DNA research, and Native American and African American genealogical research in New England. Now, since 1988, the goal of the Great Migration Study Project has been to compile comprehensive genealogical and biographical accounts of the 20,000 English men, women, and children who settled in New England between 1620 and 1640. This month, the project continues with the exciting new release of the first book in series three of the project, The Great Migration, Immigrants to New England, 1636 to 1638, volume one, A through BE. This volume contains new research to uncover the details of 129 immigrants who came to New England between 1636 and 1638 and who appear in the Great Migration Directory. Today, David will detail what you can expect to find in this new volume and how it can help you in your research. At any point during the presentation, please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to as many as we can at the end of today's session. There is no syllabus for today's presentation, but we are recording this event, and starting later today, you can freely go back and review any content from the presentation on our website and on our YouTube channel. So if you missed something on today's first listen, don't worry, you can always review the presentation later. All right, so without further ado, I will pass things over to David. Thank you, Kathleen. I'm very honored to have the chance to introduce our newest volume in the Great Migration series, and many of you are probably familiar with the work of Robert Charles Anderson, but a new name uh, introduced to the project uh, is Dr. Ian Watson. Uh, Ian Watson has degrees from both Harvard and Rutgers University. He actually joined NEHGS as a member at the young age of 12, and shortly after discovering that he had New England ancestry. Uh, after an academic career of two Scandinavian universities and many years uh, working on travel guides for Rick Steves, who I'm sure you've heard of. He uh, wrote articles for NEHS publications. Now, currently he's the editor of the New York Genealogical and Biographical Record and the project for the next volumes will be continued by NEHS staff member, Nathan Murthy. But I do want to add that um, we are grateful for the scholarship and of course, the mentorship that Robert Charles Anderson has given both Ian Watson and continues to do with Nathan Murphy to make this project move forward. Now, the project, as Kathleen addressed, started back in 1988. And I'll give you a little bit more background about Robert Charles Anderson in a few moments. However, think of the majority of individuals that are descended from just the range of people from 1620 to 1640. The Mayflower alone with the 51 passengers, it's estimated that there are at least 35 million individuals descend from those surviving passengers of 1620. And we'll look at a scale in a minute to look at how the migration is slow, the rose very highly, and then dip down after the Puritan uh, Reformation. 
So what, let's talk about what's coming up in this next volume. So you're probably wondering A to B. Well, I'm gonna give you exactly that it runs from the surnames of Abby to Betts. Now on the next slide, I'm gonna show you the list of the names. And I'm gonna leave it on there for just a couple of moments, but have no fear because at the end, I'm gonna give you a link so you can look at it yourself without sort of um, having to write down or do a screen capture. You're willing to do so if you want, but you'll see many familiar names that you probably have uh, seen in New England genealogy, like Thomas Angel or Henry Batchelor or Edward Baker or Christopher Bat. Um, other names in here may not be familiar. It could be because they in, had um, been on the passenger list or show up early in New England and then maybe return. So you may see a surname that is one that you've worked on, like the Allen family or others, and might think it might be a sibling. So this new volume might give you the latest insight to these families. And who knows, maybe you'll discover a new ancestor came in between 1636 and 1638. And I'm very delighted again to share that the last names of Abby to Betts are currently included in this volume, volume one of the new series. Now I wanted to give a little background to the Great Migration Project for you and uh, give you the sort of the understanding of why this project was started and I'll give you a little bit of more of the story of how Robert Charles Anderson and others have gathered the information uh, versus just to think it's just a batch of name and dates. These are also included with stories and the very detailed analysis of records of the 17th century have gone into this process. Many of you, of course, recognize uh, the uh, symbolism to this is, of course, is the Mayflower coming into Plymouth Harbor uh, in 1620. And, of course, many vessels that arrived into New England during that time frame do not have surviving manifest or passenger list. So the Great Migration Project had to rely on documents that proved that your ancestor was here by a certain time frame. It could be an appearance in a court record, the birth of a child, maybe their own death. Um, or maybe there was some incident recorded in the church records that mentioned your ancestor. Maybe they became a freeman, but that means they were there by a certain date. So not for everyone in the Great Migration do we have a passenger list. So don't wait until you find the passenger list. Sometimes look for the earliest record and then see if they included in the sketches. And again, the Great Migration Directory, which I'll talk about with Bob's um, books overall, uh, is a great um, sort of collection of the people that are going to be included in the project. So you have those that have been published through 1635, those that have been included from 1636 to 38 to date. And of course, this project is ongoing through 1640 and beyond. And I'll talk a little bit about the early New England Families Project, which goes 1641 to 1700. Uh, maybe in your library at home or nearby, you have some of the tomes that we really use for the scholarship of New England, uh, including Houghton's Original Persons of Quality, where you get many of these original surviving manifests or permissions to embark. Um, you may have perhaps used Martin Hollick's New Englanders in the 17th century, the 1600s, cover a majority of these great migration sketches that have already been printed, but even so much more. Um, the original volumes of The Great Migration Begins, published in 1995, of course, have had additional books and articles published, and Martin Hollick's uh, expanded edition catches that and gives you the bibliographical information. Uh, and again, it all started with The Great Migration Begins, 1620 to 1633, which incidentally, as an American ancestors member, you can access these volumes from 1620 to 33 the volumes from 34 to 35, currently online. Now, the current volume, unfortunately, is not available online, but probably in a couple of years, you will see that one online. Uh, the newer volumes are cu currently going to be available for sale only. Now, let's talk about settlement and migration. And I think one of the interesting uh, aspects on that 
is to understand where your ancestor is arriving to in essentially the years of the migration. We've been able to study that. Uh, and this is a chart from Robert Charles Anderson's book. Uh, and this will show us the time frame of arrival. As you can see here in 1620, right through about 1628, there's a very low amount of passengers that arrive. In fact, my earliest New England ancestor, Richard Ingersoll, who came over to Salem in 1629, is just at that slow peak where you start to see the movement and remember being the migration such as the Winthrop fleet. And we can see by around 1630, there's approximately a thousand settlers that are arriving that year. And then it drops down considerably back to lower numbers in 1631, and then slowly builds up. By 1631 to 32, it's on the rise. By 1633, we're back to 1,000 and beyond. In fact, by 1633, 34, there's an amass of at least 2,500 passengers every year through about 1640. And of course, that is when the time when the crown changes and Oliver Cromwell, the Lord Protectorate of London and Puritans don't have the pressures to uh, seek religious freedom and come to New England. So it drops down. So hence the 1620 to 1640 window of the great migration that Robert Charles Anderson studied. Now this map here is an interesting one showing you the earliest settlements of Massachusetts as of 1675. S settling in the coastal areas, may it be uh, northern New Hampshire and uh, Maine, all the way down the coastal of Massachusetts of Cape Cod, on the islands, into Rhode Island, Connecticut, and onto the Long Island Sound. Primarily, our ancestors first settled on the coastal areas. As, uh, the inland roads and waterways hadn't been explored as of yet. Now they start to become explored, and the, such as the Connecticut River or the Merrimack River are, are ones that people tend to travel up early on in the earliest settlements. And by 1675, almost pushes us back a bit. The King Philip's War and the raids of Philip um, and the war itself caused many of the settlements of places such as Medfield, Massachusetts, to basically become um, extinct until later years and then resettlement came in. So you may find that the wilderness changed in 1675, even though it had been expanded out, but this is the first 55 years of the New England area. A great book that is done by the female historian and genealogist L.K. Matthews, The Expansion of New England is a classic uh, book that NEHGS has reprinted and is available at the American Ancestors Shop. And you can find variety of these maps in basically a great explanation of how New England spread out all the way to the Mississippi River between the years of 1620 and the time of the Civil War. Robert Charles Anderson. Um, if you have ever had a chance to travel with Bob, meet Bob, or just attend one of his lectures, you'll know that he is truly a scholar of great renown and has tremendous knowledge on not just the Great Migration, but so many more topics. He is the director of the Great Migration Study Project, and he was educated as a biochemist and served in the United States Army in electronics intelligence. In 1972, uh, Robert he discovered his early New England ancestry and thereafter devoted his time and energies to genealogical research, so for more than half a century now. He has published his first article in genealogy in 1976 and about the same time began a plan for eventually became the Great Migration Study Project. In 1983, he received his master's degree in colonial American history from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. He was elected a fellow of the American Society of Genealogists in 1978 and served as secretary and president of that same organization. He became a contributing editor to American Genealogist and well known as also as TAG in 1979, associate editor in 1985 and co-editor in 1993. And he has been at the editorial consultant to the New England Historical and Genealogical Register since 1989. And 
truly one of the greatest scholars in 17th century research uh, that I have ever known and so many others. Now, again, just a sort of a review, we know that the project is started by Robert Charles Anderson and was started uh, over 35 years ago in 1988, but it really got its uh, original thought involved with Robert Charles Anderson back in the 1970s. So obviously a project well underway and was much needed. Um, the genealogical scholarship that had to be addressed and viewed for 17th century great migration colonists were multiple books, dozens upon books that you would have to look at. And some, uh, like James Savage, published in 1860, would give a theory that maybe Charles Pope by 1900 would disband. Then you would be wanting to look at current articles in the New England Historical and Genealogical Register, the American Genealogist, and other publications to see, do they have a better year for that person's arrival? And what Robert Charles Anderson has done is to cull all that information so it becomes sort of one-stop shopping, I like to say. And the genealogical biographical sketches in the project, again, cover from 1620 to 40. Uh, currently, now there are 13 published volumes up until the time of the new release. So we can now say we are at 14 volumes. There is also a newsletter, bound versions, uh, and also available on the database. So the Great Migration newsletter, which was published in 25 volumes, is available um, online from American ancestors as well. And of course, Robert Charles Anderson over the years and continues to have tours that go over to the UK and to explore the actual same steps in the footprints of our ancestors in the Great Migration and also um, educational programs and projects that he has shared with us online and in person, besides the searchable online databases on American ancestors. The publications themselves are tremendous. And again, there are many of these that you can find online. Many people still choose to have the hard copy of the books, but I'll tell you which ones are available uh, online and which ones you need to purchase in print. The one uh, that I use all the time, especially during my own consultations and time at NEHGS, is the Great Migration Directory. Immigrants to New England, 1620 to 1640. Again, this is not available online. It is for purchase. But this book will cover the names and the biographical details, bibliographical details for each one of the people included in the Great Migration. Um, this is a one-stop shopping. It is going to give you the name of the person. It will give you the date of the earliest known occurrence in New England. It's going to give you the name of the vessel if it's known, so you don't have to search endlessly to try to find a passenger list or a record of embarkation. If it's known for these 20 years, it's spelled out there. It also gives you the place of origin in England. So if you wanted to find out if in fact your family came from Essex, looking at the directory, if it's an immigrant during these years, it will clearly tell you. The Great Migration Begins, published in 1995, covering 1620 to 33, is only in three volumes. Now, but we did look at that chart, and it was until 1633 that we see the upswing of over 2,500 individuals per year. Um, so these first volumes did not need to be as expansive. Now, that being said, the next set, Great Migration Immigrants to New England, 1634 to 35, are in seven volumes during the peak of this great migration. We are currently working on 1636 to 38 and ultimately 39 to 40. The, again, the 1620 to 35 volumes, all 10 of those are available on AmericanAncestors.org for members to search. The Pilgrim Migration Immigrants to Plymouth Colony, 1620 to 33, takes what was done in the Great Migration Begins and gives you any updates. And this was done a few years back, but this is a great way to look at this. And this is again, a book that is still available in print not currently online. The same is true with the Winter Fleet, Massachusetts Bay Company Immigrants to New England, 1629 to 30. Again, updated information <clears throat> that was included in the Great Migration Begins in 1995, but brought forward with new details and new facts. Um, and of course, the Great Migration Newsletter, um, which you can still purchase, 
um, but it is one that you can also find online. This is really the backstory, the project as it went unfolded, talking about the locations that ancestors came from, uh, some of the historical figures that were so well involved in this, such as Winthrop and others, as well as the stories of New England communities, which, which they settled in. Uh, it's a really a wonderful piece of scholarship that uh, goes along with this project. Now, the goal of the Great Migration Study Project is to provide a concise, reliable summary of past research on the early immigrants to New England, essentially making it one place to search. To reduce the amount of time uh, finding this past work and to serve as a foundation for future research studies, it allows researchers to determine immigration uh, from 1620 to 1640 again without reviewing dozens of sources. Now, Puritan Pedigrees, the volume that will talk about the backstory of the Great Migration, is also something you may consider purchasing. This is a book by Robert Charles Anderson and covers the backstory of the Great Migration itself. Criteria for inclusion. We're now going to cover the details in regard to the inclusion and why people are in this. Now, if you've ever looked at early published genealogy books, you may have been given a date of arrival. That date could be circa 1630, based on, well, they assume that he was there because that's when the town was settled. But have you ever looked at the footnotes and the citations? Unfortunately, many early genealogies are made by uh, historians making assumptions when an immigrant arrived, not with any hard evidence. Extensive study of primary sources and records from 1620 to 1638 disproved many of the old theories of arrival dates. And of course, you may have heard the theory that my grandmother told us that we all came over on the second boat after the Mayflower. Now that boat in comparison of a 17th century vessel in the lower left-hand side of your screen compared to a cruise ship now would have been about the size if it brought all of our ancestors in the 17th century over on quote, the second boat. So just a little comic relief to uh, share with you. Now the criteria for the entire project of 1620 to 38 to date means that your ancestor has to appear in a record generated before May 22nd, 1639. That means that they had to be in a record that occurred then to be included in 1638. And I'll get a little bit more detail into that for you. Now, the also direct or indirect implication of their arrival by the end of 1638 included in a record of a later date, and that could be a deposition. Um, you could find a Thomas Williams that in 1653 states that he arrived in 1637 and is swearing in court on this fact. This is again a hypothetical example, but the where a later record could imply someone had arrived in an earlier date. Also an appearance of a member of the immediate family of a person known to have arrived in the years 1636, 37 and 38. And let me give you an example of that. Take for instance, Manuel Downing. He had three children and his first wife arrived to New England in 1630 and 1633 during two migrations. Now, Emmanuel himself did not arrive in New England until 1637. So right away, you would think that Emmanuel is going to be included in the new set um, when we get to D. However, he's already in the set because of the immediate family. Emmanuel has appeared in the set from 1620 to 33 because of his family and grouping this family together in the first series. So again, this is very true that you may have uh, an immigrant and then his parents arrived later, or in this case, the spouse and children arrived and the father followed suit after. It's a little different than most migrations, but this is why you may find someone who comes in later in an earlier volume. Now, for the specific years of 1636 to 1638, examination of all the records were done by Ian Watson and Robert Charles Anderson, generated in New England between 25 May 1636 to 22 May 1639. 
Many records generated after 1638 imply that the person named in that document had been already in New England by the year 1638 or earlier, such as these court depositions I had mentioned. Like just to give you a tip, all the records that are being uh, searched, there is a sources section in the new volume, uh, as it is also included in the earlier volumes. So when you have an abbreviation, uh, MBCR, Massachusetts Bay Col Colony Records, you can find out quickly what that is and the bibliographical record accordingly. Now, the arrival mentioned in a deposition, these are where the hard work of the genealogical uh, inquiry has begun, because it's not just looking at records that are known to have existed between the years of 1620 and 40. It's knowing that other scholars may have transcribed court records, may quarterly court or depositions that are known to exist that state someone's arrival. Perhaps you may even find a document that had not been transcribed from the 17th century in a local collection. The Great Migration is an ongoing project and we welcome any information that you may have that can add to a sketch that already exists. Why May 1636 and 38 were chosen? Well, May was chosen because most of the vessels did not leave until the spring. Uh, this is due to the bad weather in the North Atlantic earlier in the year. So if you have arrived by these dates, you would have then therefore been included in that batch of years of 1636 to 38 as an arrival. Also, it would have been impossible for a passenger on one of these ships to join a church and also apply for freemanship in time of the general court, which was held in May of 1636 and 38. The month of May was also when the annual session of the General Court of Election met. In 1636, the court met on the 25th of May and 38 on the 22nd of May. So keeping May into mind, the immigrants' dates are imperative to know that they're becoming a freeman means that they would have arrived beforehand and not immediately the same year. If someone applied as a freeman on 22 May 1638, for instance, they would have arrived the previous year in 1637. And this is implied and may not be from a passenger list, but by the uh, equation that Bob has uh, brought forth with uh, previous scholarship of the Great Migration. Sources consulted. As I mentioned, there are a variety of different sources that they have looked at. And some of those include passenger lists, but you might be surprised on some of the earliest vessels what the sources really are. The Mayflower doesn't have a passenger list. It's basically from William Bradford's account that was written over 30 years later. The Fortune, 1621, and Anne and the Little James that arrived in Plymouth Colony as well in, are basically not from passenger lists either. They're from land records. The allotment of land that was given to those that arrived at those uh, two vessel times. Now, surviving London port books from 1632 and 35 are very useful, but again, there are gaps. And post-1636, it's very limited that you find passenger lists. Sometimes they're not even passenger lists. They're permission to embark across the seas, as you'll see with one example I will show you from 1638. <clears throat> and rely on your published sources, especially the more recent ones They give citations and can footnote the source directly. Again, turning to the Great Migration Directory uh, is a wonderful way of grasping the latest scholarship uh, and disproving the ones written a century or more ago. The books such as Peter Wilson Coldham's The Complete Book of Immigrants, John Camden Houghton, the original list of persons of quality, and that also includes right down to your common uh, household servants that are arriving, um, that are having their pay off their passage. So it's not just the gentry class. And this is a tremendous book. And believe it or not, it was published well over 145 years ago. Planters of the Commonwealth by Banks is another good source to use. But again, these are long sought after. And what Robert Charles Anderson and Ian Watson and others are 
doing is making it so you don't have to look at all of these volumes. You can look at one series to answer the same question. The John Camden Houghton, The Original Persons of Quality, was published in 1880. Uh, Charles Banks' original work, Planters of the Commonwealth, published in 1930 with his work decades before. Peter E. Coldham, The Complete Book of Emigrants, was published in 1987. And again, um, with many of the persons of quality in Coldham's book, you're dealing with people outside of New England. So you're getting others that are not in the New England scope of this project uh, and may assist you in Mid-Atlantic or Virginia, et cetera. And what about Philby? The work of Philby's passenger and immigration lists are as a tremendous compilation. These tan books uh, have been published for volumes for many, many years and are available on Ancestry. Here's the slight problem. If in 1975, I wrote a genealogy book without a citation and said that my family arrived in 1634 and I didn't put a citation in it, Philby's folks would scan through the book, see the early immigration dates and include it in the collection. So when you do find something in Philby, find the source that it came from. And then from there, do your own detective work to determine, did they find that in a source uh, that is primary or is it a uh, theory? And in some cases, these are dates that can range anywhere from 10 to 20 years uh, because it's a theory. So again, if you can look at uh, Philby, use it as a clue, but not the final answer. Here's an example from the original list of persons of quality by Houghton. And this is actual a transcription of the passenger list for the Beavis. Well, it's not really a passenger list per se. It's those asking permission to embark across the seas in 1638. It's giving the names of the head of household and the amount of children, also giving occupation and where they're from and giving you their names. People like Christopher Batt, Henry Bailey, Stephen Dummer, who is actually my ancestor. And in his listing of servants include three young adults and two teenagers, uh, two young adults and one teenager, Samuel Poor, age 18, uh, Daniel Poor, age 14, and Alice Poor, age 20. These would be the uh, people that I've spent the past 40 years researching. And we're still inquisitive as to where their connection is. Are they truly servants? Or are they paying off their passage? Or are they related to the Dummer family coming from the same area? It's the genealogical scholarship that I personally am still undertaking. But again, this is a tremendously rare clue to get a list of people with their ages in the vessel they're embarking on. But I don't stop just there. I went to the uh, archives in London, at Kew, and I had this image pulled up. The next screen will show you the actual 17th century passenger list. Yes, the work that Houghton and others did came from a primary source. Some of these are actually available on findmypast.co.uk. They have actually gone to the archives and digitized these. And as you can see in the column on the right-hand side, the Dummer family and the three members of the Poor family, which we assume strongly are siblings, um, are right there. But great to go from published source to primary original documented manuscript source. Again, keep that in mind. When you're looking at the size of your family that have arrived over 20 years, they all didn't arrive on one vessel. So multiple vessels, multiple dates of immigration. This is one of the problems that historians would do in the 17th century research, that they would group that everyone arrived in a particular town by a certain date. Take, for instance, the town of Newbury, Massachusetts, settled in 1635. The plaque that's on the lower green has all those that are arrived in 1635. Many of those, including John Poor, my ancestor, is not known to be even arrive in New England until 1642. So sometimes historians will group people together, assuming they all came over and settled the town at the same time. So beware that second boat after the Mayflower theory. The list of freemen. 
obviously the Great Migration has truly used passenger lists, but also freemanship lists. These are freemen admitted to the general court. In Massachusetts, these records date back to May of 1631. And you had to be free and clear of an indenture. That means that you have paid off your passenger and you're not indebted to the person who paid it. You also in Massachusetts had to be a member of the church. Now in 1642, lower courts other than the general court allowed you to be admitted as freemen. So it got a little bit more complicated to track down later 17th century freemanship records, but you can find all of them now in print. For Plymouth Colony, part of the colony court proceedings include freemen lists. Now, unfortunately, the surviving lists from Plymouth Colony are kind of scattered. 1633 and 37 and 39 cover the earliest part and, of course, the Great Migration years. But then you have lists from 1658, 1670, and 1684. And we're not certain of those that existed that were lost. Now, by the 1690s, we have Plymouth Colony is merging in with Mass Bay Colony. So then the Mass Bay Colony records would be... Uh, place you would find it in Plymouth Colony does not no longer exist. The colony of Rhode Island. For the community of Portsmouth and Newport, the 1630 freemanship lists survive. Now there were four other towns that attempted in 1655, but again they were attempted and there were no uh, surviving freemanship records recorded in Rhode Island in those years. Now, the colony of Connecticut uh, is a little different and not so stringent as Massachusetts. Freemanship was not tied to being a member of the church. In the earliest accounting of Freemans for Connecticut, date a little late, 1669. Now, keeping in mind that the colony of Connecticut was completely separate early on from the New Haven colony, which was far more stringent than Massachusetts Bay with their feelings towards church and politics. So therefore, you did need to be a member of the church. The earliest of the New Haven lists date from three decades earlier in 1639. Colony and court records is something also that the Great Migration uh, authors have scoured. And this is the first mention over a legal dispute or a criminal action. That could be the first time that your ancestor is mentioned as being in New England. <laughs> they could have been brought to court. Maybe their pig ran into the field of the neighbor and destroyed the crops. That is a dated document and proven that you know that your ancestor had arrived by that year. Maybe it's proprietorship records on the local level that mention that a lot of land was given, maybe even tax records, or for the fact that the court records are being spoke of now, maybe they forgot to pay their taxes and they're being brought for criminal action. Now, court and colony records are very useful because many of them have been transcribed and published, uh, but the indexes can often be limited in the 19th century volumes. Then we step in with optical character recognition. Many of the early volumes that are not indexed, you may find on archive.org or Hathi Trust. And looking for these records will quickly allow you to scour the text, even when an index is not present. If you're having trouble reading original handwritten court records, remember at the beginning of most volumes, you'll find a calendar of the courts. And that could be something like the Johnson family versus the Tingley family. And that could be one of your ancestors. Given names aren't often given in the calendar of the court records, but it's definitely worth a look to see what you can find. And of course, with a family search and American ancestors and others working so hard to digitize and put colonial records online, uh, it has made it a lot easier than, say, it would have been 10 to 20 years ago to find these records simply on microfilm or in archives. <clears throat> notarial records are very useful, and we think of notarial records primarily when you're doing French-Canadian records, because the notary records are tremendous and a very useful process from the 17th century through the 20th century. However, we even have them for the 17th century for Boston. Thomas Letchford's uh, publication uh, that was published in 1885 of his notarial records exists from 1638 to 41. Again, the Great Migration Era, and may be a clue as to your ancestor's arrival because of his appearance in Letchford's journal. 
William Aspinwall was a little later, 1644 to 51, but it may also echo the fact that your ancestor arrived as an immigrant in 1646, if appearing there. It may dispel that 1905 genealogy that says that he arrived in 1630. This book was published in 1903. They're both available for you to search on archive.org, download and search. Now, town records are also something that were very valuable uh, to the Great Migration Study Project. The earliest towns did not always keep records from the beginning of the settlement. Now, we're very lucky that some of them did. Boston, Cambridge, Charlestown, Salem, Roxbury, and Watertown. And the, the practice of recording town records starts about 1633-34. Not exactly as early as you might have thought. However, in the town records, and of course, paper is very sparse, and scarce rather, uh, you'll find the mention of your ancestor's cattle mark, so-and-so is signed up as a constable in the community, and then a birth of four or five children. And then on the next page, it may talk about a border dispute between Mr. Brown and Mr. Twining about their farm. Uh, a review of these earliest records of vital records for New England uh, are tremendous because the town records often include the vital records uh, in them, but not always. Sometimes they're separate volumes. You'll find on American Ancestors, many of the published records of vital records from these earliest town records that were published in the official series starting in the earlier part of the 1900s and continue on uh, to the past decades. Church records are also very valuable because in some cases, the church record may have predated the records of the town being kept. And oftentimes I like to think that the town clerk is often also this church sexton. Now, Boston church records begin in 1630. So we're very early for that. Salem church uh, records begin in 1636, even though Salem was around for seven years, eight years earlier. Lynn Church records should go back to the 1630s, but because of a fire or a loss, they only exist starting in 1792. Charlestown original records from 1631 were recopied in 1660, but still exist. And other church records are not always from the journal kept by the church clerk. Sometimes they're from diaries, such as the records going back to 1632 for the church in Roxbury by Reverend John Elliott. In, in Dorchester by Reverend Richard Mather. And Plymouth church records are included in the history and some of the deaths of the early settlers are included in them. So this is a tremendous way of looking at some of the earliest settlements, but remembering many of them are actually already in print. <clears throat> Probate and land are also being uh, utilized for the Great Migration. And much of the earliest probate from Massachusetts, you now can find on AmericanAncestors.org, especially those dealing with the 17th century. I would also like to add that FamilySearch.org has done a wonderful job of making the access point for Massachusetts and many of the New England states available on FamilySearch.org. That means you don't need the affiliate access to be in a library. You can get it from home. And these 17th century uh, deeds are a tremendous way of looking at your ancestors' earliest arrival, even if it's later than 1640, because that purchasing of land might be the first clue of their arrival post or pre the Great Migration time frame. Miscellaneous sources that were utilized, uh, these include personal journals of John Winthrop, William Bradford, um, Hull, and Samuel Sewell, the great diaries from Boston and former judge of the Salem witchcraft trial. Published letters of the 17th century that exist in various antiquarian and historical societies that have been published through the years, including many such letters published in the New England Historical and Genealogical Register. Sibley's Harvard graduates cover those who graduated starting in 1636, the class, and all the way forward to the time of right before the Revolutionary War. So the 17th century, may have a sketch in a biography of an immigrant's child or the immigrant themselves. The ancient and honorable artillery company started in the 1630s is still active. And we recently have republished 
the listing of all of those that were involved in the ancient and honorable. Uh, it's honored to write the preface for this reprinted volume. And again, it's available from AmericanAncestors.org from our bookstore. The papers of Robert Trollowini, 1598 to 1644, were published in 1884. And records of the Saugus Ironworks for early Lynn Mass families were also consulted for the Great Migration. English records, of course, had to be examined as well. So Robert Charles Anderson traveled across to the archives in London and elsewhere. So early parish records and bishops' transcripts. The bishops' transcripts, if you may have used them before, are the copies sent to the bishop's office annually from the, each parish. And it's a wonderful collection of checks and balances because the parish records may go back to 1590, but the bishop's transcript records may even go decades before. So you may find the baptism of your great migration immigrant. English probate records, you can find such records as the Paragood of Court of Canterbury Wills on FamilySearch and on Ancestry.com. Uh, university records, like the University of Cambridge and Oxford, have many individuals, especially the clergy, that came over to these early years to New England. Calendar of State Papers and Calendar of State Papers, Colonial and Domestic, are published sets and available to search online. And these were also consulted. Now, what is included in the Great Migration series? What are you going to get in a biography? If you haven't looked before, I hope this information might lead you to dig a little deeper into the collections already online on American Ancestors or to be inquiring about purchasing one of the latest volumes we just released. What information is included? Well, the origin of your immigrant that will give you the details of where they came from and when. Their first residence in New England, where they were moved to, did they return back to England? Any and all occupations that are known to be uh, recorded for your ancestor. Did they join the church? Did they become a freeman? How about their education? Now, I may not mention they went to college, but in the inventory of their estate, may mention lots of books proving that they could read offices that they held in the colony that they settled in, their last will and testament or their intestate estate might be listed for what was, is in it that was considered value. Their birth, their death, their marriage, their immediate family, their children, any associations that are known to be with the immigrant and others per se, maybe they purchase land together, or there's an assumption that they may have been brother-in-laws. Any additional comments, especially those that Robert Charles Anderson and Ian Watson uses to disprove an older genealogy or historical volume that may give misinformation. And of course, the bibliographical notes that are included give you the references to the full-scale genealogies, keeping in mind that the Great Migration deals with the immediate family and not four, five, six, or 10 generations later. There may be a com comprehensive tome such as Henry Adams' genealogy that was done, will far exceed more than the sketch on Henry Adams in the new volume on his immediate family. <clears throat> 1636 to 1638. Let's take a look at one of the sketches. Here is George Aldrich. And as I mentioned, origin. Well, in 1910, someone may have published an article or a historical genealogy on the family, on an individual mentioned in the Great Migration, with a theory. Well, they've proven now that his origins are unknown. Now, we know that he arrived by 1636, his migration is mentioned, because he was admitted to freemanship in December 7, 1636, from the Massachusetts Bay Colony records. So there's no passenger list, and there's no vessel. His first residence that we know of is in Dorchester, Massachusetts. But by 1640, he is in Braintree, 23 years later in Menden, seven years after that in Swansea, and then again back to Menden by 1682. Now, his occupation as a tailor is mentioned in a SLR, well, that's Suffolk Land Records. So that would be the deed on volume five, page 456. It calls him in the deed as a tailor. His church membership is listed in giving the specifics coming from the Dorchester church records and the citation is embedded right there. 
And then it goes on to mentioning his freemanship again uh, as a separate category that is echoed from his migration above. Going on in the sketch, well, we can notice other details about George Aldrich. His education. Well, he signed his will, so we know that he was literate. In a deed from uh, Suffolk County, he is also signing his name. In his will, he bequeathed, quote, all my books to one of his sons, and his wife Catherine made her mark to a deed. So we're seeing that his wife was not learned to um, sign her name, but perhaps the signature is a mark because of her age. So you don't always assume your ancestors' educational knowledge on records later on in life. But in this case, um, we now know that he has books, so and he could sign his name so he could read and write. His estate talks about one acre of upland to build a house amongst others above the burying place in Dorchester. Other land records are mentioned, each with the details of where it comes from, Boston town records, Dorchester town records, etc. In his will in Menden in 1682, George bequeathed my house and land and my whole estate to my beloved wife during her life. So you're getting an abstracted information from the probate. I hope this leads you to want to see the original last will and testament. And as I say, many of those from Massachusetts you can find on American ancestors. So the same images that Robert Charles Anderson and Ian Watson looked at to transcribe these facts out are available for you to download the images uh, to your home computer. Now, continuing on with the sketch, we now know that George is born about 1611, based on the estimated date of marriage. And his marriage date, jumping down a bit, is about 1636. And this is based on an estimated birth year of his eldest known child. And his wife's name was Catherine. Oh, as you can see, we don't know her maiden name. We know that he died in Menden on March 1st, 1682-83, uh, because there are two tombstones that exist. Um, and contemporary in the cemetery, uh, the George Aldrich Cemetery name for him in Uxbridge, and the old cemetery formerly had been in Menden. You also find the marriage details in referencing his wife, Catherine, and we're getting the evidence based on gravestone dates and births of children, because not all the births and marriages are recorded. Sometimes we have to take on estimates. We know that Joseph Aldrich, the first child, is born about 1638, based on a deposition that he was 32 in 1668. Going on further, we will learn other children that he has. <clears throat> we'll also find that some of the uh, daughters and who they married, or also the names of the bride of the sons. So you can see that next generation. That may be the last part on your family tree and finding these new surnames in the Great Migration 1636 to 38 may give you the clue as to the next generation back you previously did not have. I had mentioned before about associations and comments. Uh, in 1667, George Aldrich has an association with Joe Teller of Braintree. He sought at the house of George Aldrich's son, Joseph in Menden, where he had recently been living. What is the connection? These connections are put here for further detail and Joe Teller's daughter, Hannah, Love it, quote, sent for her Catherine Aldrich to attend the birth of her child, perhaps as a midwife. In the comments, in 1645, George Aldrich was one of the 32 Braintree men who petitioned for land near the Indian Sockham Pullman and established a new plantation. Pullman was the chieftain at Shawmomet, which later became Warwick, Rhode Island. In the bibliographical notes, the best compiled work on this family is the Aldrich Family Genealogy, a typescript from 1998 held by NEHGS and the Rhode Island Historical Society, and also Alvin James Aldrich, George Aldrich Genealogy, published in Decor, Iowa, between 1971 and 88. Um, it is cited, but has some value, but contains, unfortunately, many errors. And the citations uh, that are mentioned as Swansea Historical Society is unique to George Aldrich. And the author, Ian Watson, gives you the bibliographical reference. If you don't find it in the source, look within the sketch. 
1620 to 35. Going in reverse from the new published volume, again, covers Abbey to Betts, and more volumes will arrive. But the earlier volumes you can find on AmericanAncestors.org. Now, let me show you what these sketches look like. This is an example of a person who is in New England for a long time, but we start with those that may have intended. Now, this sketch here on page 92 is Alice Ashby, aged 20, a maid servant to William Holman. She was enrolled for passenger arrival from London on the 20th of June, 1635, as a passenger on the defense. It's mentioned in Houghton's Persons of Quality on page 89. However, in the comments, we learned that she's not found in any New England records. In the London Port book, Alice Ashby's name comes before that of William Holman's wife and his five children. As a result, the indexer of Houghton fell into error, giving to five of the Holman children the same surname of Ashby. So you can see that errors are corrected. Now, John Astwood, who's below, if you look at this sketch, it is similar to what we just looked at for George Aldrich in the newer volume. You have the origin, the migration, the residences, all of the details are spelled out for you right there. And again, are available to look at on American ancestors. So as we look here, we can find the detail in the lower right-hand page of his birth and death, his multiple marriages, three marriages at this point in time, and any theories as to the wife's maiden name will also be given if it is unknown. Continuing on on the Aswood sketch, we find that he has two children, but the Aswood name is not very common in New England in the 17th century, primarily because he had a son, Samuel, that no further record is known, and his daughter, Hannah, his only surviving child, married a Stephen Freeman, later a Robert Porter, and lastly, perhaps a John Clark. And so this information will lead you to um, doing a little bit more studying on the surname origins of your ancestor, especially multiple marriages, to seek out what their maiden name perhaps was. Uh, on the right-hand side, we see another example of someone who's not a lot of information uh, is known, but John Atherson was enrolled April 18th, 1635 in London as a passenger for New England on the Susan and Ellen, but he's not seen in any New England records. So there's a variety of theories we can look at here, especially for the ladies, maybe with Alice Ashby, for instance, perhaps she's one of the Alices with no maiden name that's known. Many of the Margarets and the Janes and the Marys that we have in our family trees could be any of these ladies that no record is found afterwards. Or perhaps he did not decide to embark after all, they stayed behind. Maybe they died on the vessel coming over or died shortly after arriving and there's just no record. <clears throat> the keys of the sources are also included in the beginning uh, of the uh, Great Migration Begins database and the Great Migration 1634 to 35. You can download the PDF of all the sources, uh, and that will give you what the abbreviations are with a full bibliographical source. Some additional resources to mention. Clarence Allman Torrey, who was born uh, 155 years ago and lived into the early 1960s, meant as part of his entire life putting together sources of all those who had been married prior to 1700 in New England. Whether or not it occurred in England and they arrived um, in the 1650s, or if the marriage occurred on December 31st, 1699, or it's speculated because there was a child born in 1694 in Boston, Massachusetts. And the wife's name may not even be known, let alone her maiden name. So this set is a tremendous uh, work of 17th century research, which we recently republished, but is available on AmericanAncestors.org for you to search. Here's an example from uh, the, the record itself. When we republished it, we took Tori's handwriting, which uh, to a trained eye, isn't too difficult, but it can be a little trying because he wrote very small. We have Walter Dean, born 1612, uh, who married an Eleanor Cogan or Cozen, who we know that she was alive as of 1693, uh, and that she uh, is, they were married probably in England by 1634. 
They were in Dorchester and Taunton. And the facts about this family, again, keeping in mind, Tory died in 1962. So are these are published genealogies and histories and articles practically before about 1960. So you have the name of the title of the books or tag, for instance, the American genealogist. Um, and you get the page number. At the beginning of Tory as well, we have the citations that you can find out what these abbreviations stand for, and you can seek out the book. Again, if it's prior to 1930, many of them you may find um, on archive.org or Hathi Trust, and you can see the digital version and already know the page number associated from Tory. The match itself uh, for the New England marriages to 1700, as you can see right in the middle, you can um, download the PDF of Tory sources and have it handy for when you're looking at the actual sketches. Again, search by an individual immigrant or maybe the child of the immigrant or the grandchild. Again, this is taking into fact marriages in all of New England prior to 1700. And uh, or maybe just look at the surname and scour through. Maybe you'll find siblings of your ancestor you were unaware of. Here's an example of Tory source list from the PDF that you can download from American Ancestors. It will give you a complete bibliographical with uh, author, publisher, and place of publication, and the date it was published. And you'll already have the page number from the, each one of the sketches that were done in Tory. Another great book is the work by the preeminent genealogist Meredith Colkett, and this is Founders of Early American Families. And this is a publication that is used by the Order of the Founders and Patriots in America. This hereditary organization, which I'm a proud member of, um, takes into fact those that have arrived the first half decade after Jamestown, so 1607 to 1657. This book itself is um, one that you can find very useful. Many libraries will have it available, uh, and it will cover not just New England, and in the case of New Englanders with a Great Migration Study Project goes to 1640, this will give you an extra 17 years of possible sources for your ancestors' arrival. Uh, a great book to utilize in your research. I had mentioned before Martin Hollick, New Englanders in the 1600s. And again, this is taking sort of what Tory has done and brought it into more recent scholarship. Now, Tory may have looked at a book in 1952 and could have been the scholarship and the leading scholarship of the day. However, by 1985, a book could have superseded it, corrected it, and changed the complete origin of that immigrant. Looking at Martin Hollick's book, again, not online, but available from American Ancestors, will give you those new citations, or will also quickly tell you what have already been included in the Great Migration, 1620 to 35. Uh, it's a great uh, way of finding newer scholarship for older families. Further study projects that American ancestors have undertaken include going beyond the Great Migration and using Clarence Allman Tory as a bit of a leaping off point. Now, 1641 to 1700, is currently being done by Alicia Crane Williams. In this project on AmericanAncestors.org, as well as published volumes that are available, will allow you to quickly find some of the first families, 1641 and 42, as this progress continues to 1700. The base of this, Clarence Allman Tory's New England marriages prior to 1700, looking at those next generation. So what these sketches are going to be done are they're being grouped by the year of marriage itself. So it's not alphabetically across the board A to Z, but covering um, the year of marriage being considered in the first two volumes of 41 and 42. And they is now searchable on American Ancestors and new sketches are posted online. Who is included again? Using Clarence Allman Tory's New England prior to 1700 as a guide, anyone who was married in New England during this time period will ultimately be included in this project, will be worked on over the next decades. 
what information is included. Practically about the same as the Great Migration series. Um, a little bit different titles, but you get the name of the groom, migration and residences, their parentage and family. Because the interesting thing is the Great Migration series of 1620 to 40 may include an immediate family. The new sketch on New England families may take that immigrant's child that's only mentioned uh, in the listing of children with the name of the spouse and bring them the next generation forward, essentially giving the child of the immigrant from the Great Migration and their children. So the individuals that are in 1641 to 1700 do not necessarily mean that they're an immigrant. They could be the child or in some cases on the later volumes, a grandchild or great-grandchild of an immigrant from decades before. You'll get the birth, the death, land records, any community references, the um, military records, court records, occupation, uh, personal estate, children, resources, and a variety of commentary to either uh, support or uh, close the book on earlier scholarship that is not considered as reliable. <clears throat> Here's an example. Um, it looks a little different than the Great Migration series, whereas the title of each of the subcategories uh, under the individual uh, are left justified. So this is John Allen, and you're getting into the parentage, giving you reference that John Allen, his father, George Allen, is in the Great Migration series too. That means he is in 1634 to 35, volume one, pages 27 to 35. So you can go back to a previous generation that's already been included. But John Allen would be very minimal in a small sketch of the children, uh, whereas now it is completely fleshed out with further detail. You get the land, court records, his estate, and including, again, transcriptions of some of the most important facts from his last will and testament. Going on gives us all of the information on his five children, as well as a commentary. Now, in Robert Charles Anderson and Ian Watson's books on the Great Migration, you'll find that the footnotes are embedded. So you'll find the abbreviations put right into the paragraph itself. This is a little different. And here you'll find footnotes of each one of the pages and your sources right there. Have no fear, the sources are available for the early uh, the families project as well. And let's talk a little bit about periodicals. There are a vast amount of periodicals. The first in print was the New England Historical and Genealogical Register. We've been publishing this quarterly since 1847. But other great publications, such as the New York Genealogical and Biographical Record, now that Ian Watson currently uh, is working on, and work such as the American Genealogist, the Mayflower Descendant, and others, are really important pieces of scholarship where the great migration and later generations are treated practically in every issue that give you new clues and new scholarship of things that are uncovered both here in New England and across uh, in the UK as well. Some of these publications you may have at home or you may subscribe to. As an American Ancestors member, I you may have scour the New England Historical and Genealogical Register on our website on American Ancestors, or the New York Biographical and Geographical Genealogical Record, another great publication, the Mayflower Descendant, the American Genealogist, the Virginia Genealogist, and so many more. Uh, and again, the Mayflower Descendant, the American Genealogist, and the Virginia Genealogist, you can actually find on AmericanAncestors.org. The other project, of course, going back to 1620. As you may know, with the commemoration of the 400th in 2020, with the conjunction with the General Society of Mayflower Descendants, American Ancestors has brought you the fifth generation of the beloved silver books. That means the lowest generation to you, closest generation to you is available. And these are searchable on American Ancestors, not the entire volumes, because General Society of Mayflower Descendants are still selling them. But the fifth generation is available. Also, you can search another valuable database. The Mayflower uh, Society has given us the applications, which we have scanned. And that is for every member who was born before December 31st, 
1920, giving the privacy of those living members. And those are again on AmericanAncestors.org and you'll see the actual application. From the silver books or the pink books, you'll find the sketches put together on these early families. And again, this is going beyond the Great Migration first generation. And going here, we are looking at the third generation of George Soule, Joshua Soule, born in 1681. Now here he's married in 1704, 1705. So a sketch like this wouldn't be included in early, uh, the early New England families, nor would it be in Great Migration. His parents and grandparents will be listed, of course, but not uh, Joshua. So looking at these other projects, such as the Mayflower Silver Books, uh, are allowing us to look at later generations. Also, reliable published genealogies will cover the later generations other than the immigrant and their children. American ancestors will allow you to search the pub periodicals right here, such as the New England Historical and Genealogical Register. You may find a citation in the Great Migration Project that you want to search. Pick on the periodical that you wish, and you can put in the volume and the page. From there, you can go page by page and download the images. This is an article that was published in the Register in 1853, and you can go from page 83 download it, scroll up and down, <clears throat> and then turn the page or change the volume altogether. 17th century records that you may have looked at in your own research that have led you to find that you have a great migration ancestor may include vital records, church records, even cemetery records. In the case of cemeteries, most of the time you're going to be finding gravestones. Hopefully it's a period gravestone and not a granite one that was put there 50 years ago. Probate records, court records, town records. We talked about the ancient honorable artillery company. So even military records. And even those two uh, notaries in Boston, uh, including Letchford, may be the way you found a clue to your 17th century ancestor. Now this is true even outside of New England. These are some of the most commonly used primary sources define when our ancestor arrived in New England and is the process, in the key records that we look at for such projects as the Great Migration. Vital records were very, very lucky for New England. As so many records are available on AmericanAncestors.org and FamilySearch.org, you can still go to a library such as the New England Historical Genealogical Library in Boston and look at the actual published volumes as we have those available as well. The original books you can also look at at home. Currently, American Ancestors is closed for our renovation and completion of our new uh, building in 97 Newbury with our Discovery Center. But you can find some of these books that were done over a century ago on Family Search, American Ancestors, or even archive.org. Here we look at a published book of the vital records of Dedham. And we hear in 1635 that John, the son of John Baldwin and Joanna, his wife, was born the 24th of the fourth month of 1635. Obviously, John Baldwin will be included in the Great Migration, but maybe it's the discovery of an ancestor born in 1620 to 40 with his parents listed that may lead you to now look at the Great Migration projects. These tan books, this is a view from the seventh floor from Abington, Massachusetts, right down to Yarmouth. These books were the start of what genealogists used for Massachusetts research. Powering over these, these books went from being only book to microfiche, to microfilm, to digitized, to being able to search on your cell phone, on your app. So these are great ways of finding scholarship, but in American Ancestors, we like to bring you the original as well as the technology you can use from home. One of the greatest books that we've recently published is by my colleague, Rhonda McClure, and is the sixth edition of the New England Research Guide. Again, imperative if you have New England ancestors to get a copy of this. This will give you quick information as to probate offices, land records, various archives you may not even be aware of, but it gives you some other great clues. Let me show you. It's going to give you the hours and locations of those courthouses. 
Maybe you want to visit where your ancestor is from, making sort of a travel checklist, if you will, of the repositories and where records are to see the originals might be something on your plan of your trip. Going on further, you can find in each state a breakdown of the name of the town, when the town was incorporated, its county, and the parent town that the town may have been created from. Acton, Maine was created in 1830, incorporated from Shapley. And also you find other towns with the daughters from the original town. My hometown in Stoughton, Massachusetts was daughtered out and created the towns of Canton, Avon and Sharon, Massachusetts, which didn't exist originally in 1726. It's also important to use a book like this to find out the original county names. For my hometown in Stoughton, if I was to look for deeds in the 1780s, I wouldn't look in my county of Norfolk, which wasn't founded until 1793. I would look in Suffolk County, one that we'd associate with Boston and is 17 miles away from where I live now. This guidebook will also give you great detailed maps. I know many of us turn to the internet, but I also find that this guidebook is something you can bring with you on a trip and have as a quick reference. As much as I love online resources, I still love the ones you can hold in your hands. I'm sure you do too. The Gray Migration Study Project also has its own website. GrayMigration.org will give you further information on the project and where it's going and where it's been, and as well as the links to the publications that are available. I want to remind you how you could find uh, volume one of the new series. You go to shop.americanancestors.org. It's highlighted on our page under latest releases, the black volume on the left. And again, remember those names that I told you you didn't have to write down? That's okay, because if you click on it, the next image you'll see is a listing of all the sketches from Abby to Betts. I hope that one of them is your ancestors, or if you've owned the previous volumes, how wonderful to continue the collection of great scholarship by Robert Charles Anderson, Ian Watson, and soon Nathan Murphy, to have this as a complete collection for your own personal library or a public library that you know has this. Do remind them. It's a great way of continuing uh, the inspiration of Robert Charles Anderson with future publications that hopefully will reveal details on your ancestors. It's been an honor and a pleasure to bring you the details on the Great Migration uh, newest volume, 1636 to 38. And I hope that I can answer some of your questions. Great. Thank you so much, David. Uh, very exciting to have this new volume and to learn more about it today from you. Um, so we will be getting to your questions. We've had a lot of great questions coming in and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, before we do that, I just want to quickly breeze through some upcoming events that you might be interested in. Uh, so first this month, uh, starting tomorrow, actually, we have an online course on demystifying DNA, getting started with genetic genetics genealogy. Uh, this will be presented by our colleague, senior genealogist Melanie McComb. Again, the first class is tomorrow. Uh, this should be a great course. Definitely recommend checking that out. Then on Thursday this week, we have our Family History Roundtable, Traveling for Your Research. This will be a panel discussion that David will be joining in on, as well as our senior genealogists, Rhonda R. McClure and Melanie McComb. Um, that should be a fun one. And then finally, we have the online seminar, Writing and Publishing Your Family History on February 10th. There are recorded course lectures and other materials that are available ahead of time. So if you do register today, you'll have access to those instantly with then uh, a live session on the 10th. You can learn more about these and all of our upcoming events at AmericanAncestors.org slash events. All right, so now we will go ahead and get into your questions. So first off, David, I wanted to ask, we had a lot of questions coming in about the Great Migration Directory and its relationship mm -hmm. to this new volume. Um, right. So a couple of questions. Um, first, are all of the passengers in this new vol volume also included in the Great Migration Directory? And uh, does the Great Migration Directory include all passengers, including ones that don't have their own volumes published yet? Correct. 
So what the Great Migration Directory has done, it's summarized all those that will be included to date uh, through 1640. Of course, there's always new scholarship and there may be someone that is a surprise with a record in England or even in New England, some private journal that may surface um, that may give a clue. We always hope that we'll find more. Uh, so the directory, again, is just um, the abstract of the information. The entry will include, again, the name, the date of the earliest occurrence in the colonies, the name of the vessel, if it's known, the date of uh, the place of origin, as well as any bibliographical references that you would find for the person. So obviously, if it's already been in a published volume of the Great Migration, or an article in the New England Historical and Genealogical Register, or the American Genealogist, any of the best scholarship is going to be spelled out. And of course, we'll include older scholarship if uh, Robert Charles Anderson has deemed it as still valid. Um, and again, it's just a summary. It's not going to give you all of the information. So a typical sketch in the Great Migration could be four pages. This uh, little rundown is only a few sentences, if that. So it's a, basically a bibliography of individuals that are in the Great Migration, not uh, an exhaustive sketch like you would find when you look at each one of them in the series. Okay, perfect. Thank you, David. Mm -hmm. um, another popular question, we had a lot of questions coming in about Freeman, uh, which you had talked about. Um, I'm wondering if you can kind of reiterate what this designation is and kind of who Freeman were. Sure. So imagine your ancestor is coming over and he pays for his own passage. Well, he is free and clear. He is not indebted to anyone. Now, you may have an ancestor whose passage was paid for by, like one of mine, through Stephen Dummer. They were listed as, quote, as servant. So they are indentured servants. And that passage, until it's paid off, either financially or by work, and uh, for that individual, they wouldn't be free and clear of their debt. So once you are free and clear of your debt or you initially come over, having already paid your own passage, uh, you would need to then, in Massachusetts, or as in the other colonies, it's going to change, be a little different, have to be a member of the church. This would allow you to go forward and become a freeman. This would allow you to vote and also serve on the jury. All right. Thank you, David. And um, related to that, we had a question about, um, you had mentioned that they would need to join the church. Um, could you specify, would that be any church or one specific denomination? Well, in the 17th century, especially in Massachusetts, the first parish church would be primarily the uh, the church of the colony. Uh, so therefore, you're not finding multiple churches. In most cases, sometimes you might have a first or a second church, but these are the Puritan churches of the community itself uh, that they would have to be and become a member. Okay, great. And then uh, last question about this. Um, was there a minimum age for admission as a freeman or did the applicant have to be married or maybe the head of a family? And they didn't have to be married or head of a family. Um, and 21 is typically the age that I say. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and then we also got a lot of questions. Uh, I'm wondering if you can reiterate what from the Great Migration Study Project is available online for searching. I would be glad to. So the first series is called The Great Migration Begins, and that is a separate database on American ancestors. And that covers all those included in the first three volumes published in 1995 by Robert Charles Anderson. And that's going to be A to Z, anyone who arrived 1620 to 1633. The next seven volumes were done for the years 1634 to 35. Those are also A to Z and are complete. And those two years are also a separate database. And they're broken down by the volume itself. So when you go to American Ancestors, you can go to our A to Z list of databases, type in the title, the subject as Great Migration, and you'll find them all very easily. Great. Thank you so much. Um, 
next uh, I'm going to ask you to kind of put on your prediction hat, David, because um, mm -hmm. I know we probably don't have solid answers for this. Um, but as you can imagine, we got a lot of questions in about when, uh, you know, the rest of the B's will be published and then, you know, later in the alphabet as well. Um, can you give us maybe a rough timeline on planned publication dates for for future books in this series? Well, I wish I had Nathan Murphy on a uh, phone of friend right now, but um, <laughs> I can tell you that from what I've heard, and please don't hold me to it, is that perhaps uh, by late fall, early winter of 2024, uh, going into 2025, we'll have the next set of volume, the next volume rather, uh, that will cover from um, bets to the next batch uh, into either the B's or maybe even C. I'm not entirely sure. I don't have a sort of a, a layout of all of the publication uh, plan dates, but I heard perhaps late fall is a possibility. Okay, great. And then um, another prediction question, I'm afraid. Uh, we did get a lot of questions since you mentioned our research center in Boston of when that will be reopening. Um, I think that's actually kind of a similar timeline, right, David, about kind of fall 2024 is is what we're looking at right now? Correct. That is, that's what I have been told. And again, uh, we're all working from home as Kathleen and I are. Uh, we don't have access to the building itself. Uh, so we're all anxious to get back in as well. Um, and of course, with buildings and construction, there's always one or two snags that could come up. So uh, it's not a uh, solid date, but if you tune into AmericanAncestors.org, you'll see on the front of our webpage as soon as we know, and we'll let you know when you can come back in. And I look forward to seeing so many of you, and perhaps you may even consider coming in and having a consultation with myself or one of my colleagues, or just roam the stacks and explore the new and exciting library that will expand from 97 Newbury to 101 Newbury. Great. Well, thank you so much, David. Um, I'm afraid we're in a bit of overtime here, so that's all we have time for today. Um, I know we did have a lot of questions coming in, so if we didn't get to your question, or if you do think of one later on, uh, do feel free to contact us at education at nehgs.org, or you can also chat with our genealogists for free online Monday through Saturday from 9 to 5 Eastern time. Uh, this service is free and open to everyone and can be accessed at AmericanAncestors.org slash chat. Um, I highly recommend checking that out um, for a lot of the questions we didn't have time for today. Um, you can definitely get those answered there. Thank you again for joining us, and you will have an opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback on today's webinar. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any feedback is very helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of our members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American Ancestors to help keep these programs free and to create more. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center at AmericanAncestors.org slash education. Thank you again, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.